Let's turn to another example of optimization, which is going to be to minimize the quantity instead of maximizing it. Usually this happens when the quantity is average cost. You'll notice that not often do they ask you what is the minimum value of total cost, because that kind of means I probably shouldn't make anything, right? If I didn't make anything, then that's going to cost me the least amount of money possible. Um, so that's a trivial question, so we don't usually ask you to minimize total cost. However, average cost is conceptually how much did it cost you for one item? What is the average cost per item at a given production level? And that tends to be high at the beginning when you're making only a few things due to a high fixed cost. And then it goes down and sometimes it goes back up again. Okay, so oftentimes when we form minimum, I'm sorry, when we form average cost function by dividing total cost by x, we can find a minimum in the average cost function. Okay, so that's why we always make it a little bit harder like that. Let's say that I've given you this total cost function right here, and in this problem, I'm just warning you, there's going to be a little bit of issues from the units, okay? So c of x is given to me as this form right here, and c of x is in dollars, but everybody take note right now, x is not in just single items, x is in hundreds of items. Watch out for something weird like that. We're going to have to keep that in mind the entire time as we try to answer the question, first of all, what level of production minimizes average cost? Okay, in the usual way, we will form average cost, take its derivative, solve for the critical points, locate the minima, but then when we have that minimum value of x, it's not in items. It's in hundreds of items. So if it asks you what level of production rounded to the nearest item, then you're going to have to take it out to two decimal places and multiply it by 100 to get it rounded off to the nearest whole item. Okay? The other question is, what is the minimal average cost per item? That's another tricky spot because they want to know what is the minimum that I can make each of my single items for, but you can see that when I form the average cost function, which is going to be the ratio of the total cost divided by the number of items, the units that carry through this problem are in dollars, total cost in dollars, and then x is in hundreds of items. Okay, so for example, if c bar of x came out as 5, that would be $5 per hundred items or five cents an item. So when they're asking me for what is the minimal average cost per item, we're going to have to take the output of what the minimal average cost is and then divide it by a hundred so we can consider how much it makes just for the, how much it costs just for the one item as opposed to how many dollars does it cost for a hundred items. All right, so we're going to see that take place inside the problem. So watch out for the units here. X is in hundreds of items. Okay, so I already kind of started this off. Um, by now, I would definitely expect you to have in your mind that average cost is total cost divided by number of items, okay? So keep in mind that you should know that, just like how you are expected to know, that profit is equal to revenue minus cost. So we're going to form the C bar function, which represents average cost, by taking the cost function, dividing it by x, Oh, usually this is a lot easier, you know, because usually they give me a polynomial where they've just factored out each term, and so I just go by term by term, dividing each term by x. Here, they haven't been so nice about it. They said total cost is 10.5 times this quantity, 0.02x plus 3, cubed. All right, so I have two choices. I have to make a choice. Um, either I'm just going to divide it by x and use the quotient rule on this, or I'm going to foil this out, but this is like a threefer, where I would have to go 0.02x plus 3, times it again, times it another time, one, two, three of them, because it's cubed. If this was squared, I would totally do it, because foiling a squared is not a big deal. But a cubed, that's kind of too hard, and now I'm always looking for the easiest route out. I think in this case, if it was higher than squared, if it's cubed or higher, I think now the easiest thing to do is going to be to have to, oh, use the quotient rule to get derivative. All right, it's not that big of a deal because at least the bottom is just x, so like that's not too complicated of a function. I will choose to use the quotient rule. Okay. All right, so c bar prime of x is going to be 
Oh, quotient rule, f prime g minus g prime f, all divided by g squared. Okay, so let's follow this along. First, I'm going to say f prime, so the constant multiple 10.5 10 10, 10 just stays there. The 3 comes down. This stuff is now to the 2. I'm still inside the f prime right now. Did I finish f prime? You guys, do you, do you remember your derivative rules? Is that f prime right there? Did I miss anything? Chain rule? Chain rule? Right. I have to multiply by the coefficient of the x inside here due to the chain rule. This is my most common mistake in the classes that I teach is that right here, since I've already got so much going on, Students will often neglect to multiply by this coefficient, which is the derivative of this inside linear function. Please don't forget it, because if you do forget it, since you're inside a problem where you have to analyze when this is equal to zero, it's going to kind of mess up the rest of the problem. And then you're going to get really disheartened, because you're not going to be able, most likely, to find the roots. Okay? So definitely check and make sure you took that derivative right. Remember, this entire thing right here is f prime. Okay, so f prime g minus g prime, which luckily is just 1, times f. So you can see that I have not written anything down for g prime there, because g prime is just equal to 1. Okay, so there's a secret 1 right there, and then we're going to divide that whole entire thing by g squared. Okay, now I have to solve for when is this equal to 0, or does not exist. <laughs> I know, it looks pretty bad, but it's really, it's not going to be too bad. Um, first thing I want to address is the does not exist part. You notice that when x equals 0, this does not exist. However, I am not choosing to even consider that as one of my critical points because the average cost function itself has its own domain. I, of course, I should probably give a domain to this function that seems reasonable, so negative x is, is not reasonable. But the other thing is, if I let x equals 0, I'm going to get a vertical asymptote in my average cost function. So I don't even want to let x equals 0 be in the domain of average cost at all. Okay, so this one has a domain coming with us where x is strictly greater than 0. That's because x equals 0 is not even defined there, so it can't be in the domain. Okay, cool. Because that gets rid of the whole critical point where if the bottom is equal to 0, it does not exist. I don't have to consider that. It's really not in the domain of this application. All right, so that just leaves me with trying to equate the numerator, the top here, equal to 0. And that would probably be a lot easier if I combined all these pesky-like terms. Um, so let me just, in green, show you all the constant terms that you should multiply by each other. Here's one, and here's one, and here's one. And so when I take all those three numbers, and multiply them by each other, then I'm going to get 0.63x. All right? So I've got 0.63x times 0.02x plus 3 quantity squared minus 10.5 times that same thing to the cube equals 0. Well, doesn't that make it look a little better? Just a little bit. Okay, now here's a trick I'm going to do that's going to make it look a lot better. You guys know what I'm about to do? I'm going to cancel some of these terms here. You see, I have two of these factors right here, and I have three of these factors right here. So actually, what I can do to both sides of this equation is I can divide by that squared term. Okay? Notice this squared quantity here is a common factor. It appears right here on this. See? It appears right there. And then it appears right here as well. But this one has three of them instead of two. So if I have three of them and I divide off two of them, what's going to happen is I'm just going to have one left. Okay? So that's why I crossed out the cubes because that cube turned into the first power. All right, so that's how I can make it really, really simple. Um, so I'm going to erase that I did that, but hopefully you guys understand that I did that. And my equation reduces down to just 0.63x minus 10.5 times this stuff to the first power equals 0. And that is a whole lot better, isn't it? Because that's just a linear equation right there. 
Okay, so the next thing that you're going to want to do here is multiply this stuff through. So you get 0.63x minus 0.21x minus 31.5 is equal to 0. Okay, and then you're going to combine these two like terms right here. So I'll just erase this right here. And what it really settles down to, if I want to solve for where this numerator right here is equal to 0, what it really settles down to is 0.42x is equal to 31.5. Wasn't that nice, right? I had this whole giant thing on top of here, and really, it's just this linear equation right here, after I cross out a bunch of stuff. And so dividing that through, I got that x is equal to 75. All right. Now 75 is my critical point. Remember, I don't know too much about it yet. I just know that it's a critical point. And so I do have to go through with considering the c bar prime sine number line. It's always the sign of the derivative that you've been analyzing. There's the 75 right there. And you can tell that if you put in some test point that's lower than 75, oh geez, really, I gotta put it in there? Yeah kind of, or if you're lazy like me, you have already thought that you should also graph it, right? And a picture's worth a thousand plugins, isn't it? Yeah, so instead of plugging in some test points here, let's go the alternative route, where we actually take a graph of C bar, and it looks like the C bar equation kind of dips down and then goes back up. Nice, and so it has a minimum right there, x equals 75 and it's decreasing and then it's increasing and so we have now confirmed that we have a relative min. Sweet! And then the other thing that we can confirm once we have this picture is that the relative min is also the absolute min. You see, because the function goes down and it hits that bottom point and then it just keeps going up and up and up and it's going up for the rest of the time there. So not only is it a relative min, but it is the absolute min that we truly seek when we're trying to answer the question, what minimizes, all together minimizes, the average cost. Okay, so the absolute min is located at x equals 75. So let's go ahead and start answering our questions. And don't forget about what I underlined in orange. What level of production minimizes average cost? Round it to the nearest item. How many items? 75 items? Oh, don't forget about the underlined part. It's going to be 75, oh, geez, that's dirty, um, times 100, so 7,500 items. Okay, remember, we have the x in hundreds of items, so we had to multiply that by 100. Okay, great, so we're almost done. We just have the one more question. What is the actual minimal average cost? And remember, it's requested that we answer that in dollars per item, not in dollars per hundreds of items, which is what it's going to come out to. Okay, so this is a little confusing, but we can take care of it, all right? So it's located at x equals 75, and the next thing we have to do is plug that back into the C bar equation. Okay, now keep in mind that when we have the C bar, the input wants to be in hundreds of items. So even though we know that it's like 7,500 items, that's 75, 7,500 items, right? So the input is in hundreds of items, so do not put 7,500 there. That's what I'm trying to say. Put the number 75, not into this junk, because you'll get zero. That's where you got the 75, but into this right here the C bar, and then you're going to get 12.7575 repeating. Oh, that's a cool number. Okay, what were the units on C bar again? They were units of dollars per hundred items. Okay, now this is a little confusing. If it's 12.75 dollars per hundred items, how much does it cost me to just make one item? Uh, <clears throat> you might get a little confused, but I'll tell you how to unconfuse yourself. There's only two ways to go. Either you're going to times this by 100, or you're going to divide it by 100. Okay, if I times it by 100, then I'm saying it's $1,275 per item. That sounds ridiculous. It's only costing me 12 bucks to make 100 of them. So it can't cost me 1200 to make one of them. Okay, so that's the wrong way. 
So if you got confused, try to like logic your way out of it like that. What really makes sense is that if it cost me 12 bucks to make 100 of them, it only cost me 12 cents to make one of them. Right, so I'm dividing it by 100 so that I can transfer this over into 0 0.1276, uh, I guess, to round it off, dollars per item. Okay, so if they want that to the nearest cent, I guess you could round that further to say it's about 13 cents per item. But you may want to put that as four decimal places because you kind of want to know precisely. It sounds like you're making quite a number of these items. So I probably wouldn't round it to uh, two decimals. I'd probably take it out to four. And the answer is that it's costing me $0.1276 dollars per single item, which is the same thing as saying $12.75 to make a hundred items.